Last month, my wife and I were invited by our friends Joel and Susie to go on a little five-day vacation to the wonderful state of Tennessee, to Gatlinburg to be exact. I've been friends with Joel since I was in eighth grade and I've known his wife Susie since I was 16. So, needless to say, these people have a lot of dirt on me. But they were headed down to their cabin and wanted to share it with us and of course we said yes. It was my wife's first time in Gatlinburg and only my second time. Gatlinburg is at the base of the Smoky Mountains and it was beautiful. All the trees were full of leaves and had that fresh new green color. Flowers were blooming. The bugs were in full effect. Every morning as I read, there were all these carpenter bees that just kept buzzing around and buzzing around. And then there's the black bears. They were active. We didn't see any, but if you didn't take care of your trash properly, you knew they were there the next morning. And I was torn. Do I want to see a bear up close? I'll leave them to the TV screens. I say up close. My wife? Not so much. We had a great time walking the strip, taking in a Soul of Motown show, and eating a lot of great food. The last full day that we were there, we decided to take a pink Jeep tour. You ever been on one of these tours? They've been around for 62 years and have locations in Arizona, Nevada, and Tennessee. You jump into, of course, a pink Jeep that's been modified to carry eight people with a heavy-duty roll cage and windows that unzip so you can see all the way around. It was amazing to smell the fresh mountain air and see the blue skies above. We did a three-hour tour. It's not like that Gilligan's Island tour because we didn't have any luggage. This tour would allow us to go from the streets of Pigeon Forge up to the Great Smoky Mountains about 6,000 feet. As we were driving into the foothills, our tour guide, Steve, pointed out a huge building with a red roof and proceeded up the mountain. Along the way, Steve would tell us about the people, the places, and the events that have taken place over the years. There was one event that stuck with me because it involved a river, the Little River, a log jam, and some dynamite. See, loggers would cut down trees and they'd use the river to float the logs downstream to the mills. And this time there was a huge log jam in the river. So one wise man, he had to be single because there's no way that my wife would allow me to have dynamite. So there was this wise single man who took a bunch of dynamite and blew up the log jam. And here's where it's cool. He not only blew up the log jam, but changed the course of the little river. And it created what's called the Sinks Waterfall. He used so much TNT that a river had a new route. That is awesome. Give me some tannerite or dynamite and take me to a river. Show of hands. Who's with me? We continued up the mountain and heard about the needs of the park and how during the depression in the 1930s, that's, that's almost 100 years ago. It's 2020. That was almost 100. Uh, oh, well, I digress. So let's keep going. The young men would be paid $1 and they had to work for six months building bridges, railways, and clear paths. The government realized that these men in the woods with 30 bucks a month in their pockets was not stimulating the economy like they'd hoped. So the men had to send back $25 back to their home so it would help kickstart the economy. Then one man wanted to get the other $5 that was in their pockets. So he opened up a can pancake house. Pancakes were cheap and they were filling for the workers. So it was a huge success and others opened. And pretty soon it was a bunch of pancake houses. And that's why you have in Gatlinburg and Pigeon Forge a pancake house on every single block. There was a need and someone responded to that need. So we got to the highest elevation of the tour we all got out, took, a, took in the sights, all the beautiful shades of green, the birds chirping, the wind blowing, the foothills of the Smokies. And Steve walked up behind us and uh, said, hey, do you remember that building with the red roof? Can you find it? We did. It was but a speck. We were lifted above the noise and distractions of the hustle and bustle of every life into a perfect setting. We know that's not how real life happens. It's the real hustle and bustle is where life really goes on, where your growth takes place and decisions are made. Well, good morning. My name is Todd Mullins, and I am on staff here at the Point Church, and it's always an honor to get the opportunity to share God's Word with you and what He shared with me. We're starting a new series today called The Life of Jesus, as told by Mark in the book of Mark, the second book in the New Testament. Today, we'll be taking a high-level view or a pink Jeep tour of the book of Mark, a 6,000-foot view, and then for the rest of the summer, we'll be getting into the streets, the alleyways, the homes of those that interacted with Jesus. We'll walk side by side with Jesus and His disciples. We'll see Jesus, who is more powerful than any dynamite, change lives like the course of that little river with those that he encounters. We'll see needs and those needs met by the only person that can satisfy any and all of our needs, and that is Jesus Christ himself. So are you ready? All right, let's go. Get in the pink jupe and get yourself strapped in. The book of Mark is the second book in the New Testament, and it chronicles Jesus' journey from Galilee to Jerusalem. And along the way, we'll see other notable places like Nazareth and Caesarea Philippi, Jericho, Bethany, Mount of Olives, the Garden of Gethsemane, and Golgotha. We'll meet people like John the Baptist, Simon, Andrew, James and John, the Brothers of Thunder, and Simon Peter. We'll get to hear Jesus' teaching in parables. We'll see Jesus' healing in miracles. And we'll feel Jesus' pain and betrayal as those around him deserted him at one of his lowest points. The book of Mark is set up as a drama set in three acts. 
the first in Galilee, the third in Jerusalem, and the second shows how Jesus got from point A to point B. In Act 1, everyone is blown away and thinks, who is this Jesus? In Act 2, it's the disciples struggling with, what does it mean for Jesus to be the Messiah? In Act 3, we see Jesus become the Messianic King. Mark, who is called John Mark, as he's called in the book of Acts. First, I want to caution us on one thing, and that's idolatry. Not adultery, that's a different sermon for another day, but idolatry. We often put the writers of the gospel, or really anyone in the Bible readings, like a Joseph or a Mary on a pedestal, and we idolize them so much that they take the place of Jesus. The other day I was talking with a gentleman and his wife, and out of nowhere, this guy says, is there anything else Catholics do wrong besides worship Mary? I was like, uh, after I wiped up the coffee I spit out, I said, what? And before he could ask the question again, his wife said with a tone, if it weren't for Mary, we wouldn't have Jesus. Again, after I wiped up the coffee I spit out, I said, what? I spent the next few minutes explaining how Mary was chosen by God. And if it wasn't Mary, then God would have chosen someone else. So I would like to caution us on putting Mark on a pestle or giving him or anyone else an even foothold as Jesus. Today, the goal is for you and I to look at four. There are more, but today we'll look at four characteristics of who Mark was by his strengths, his weaknesses, accomplishments, and his life lessons. We will do so that we can get a better perspective of his writings about the redeeming life of Jesus Christ and the events that took place in the Gospel of Mark. Let's set the scene. Mark, or John Mark, was not a disciple. The book of Mark was written in 55 to 65 AD. The audience was probably those in Rome, the Jews, Gentiles, and Roman citizens that were under the rule of Tiberius Caesar. It was probably the first gospel written because we find that the other gospels written, quote, all but 31 verses. We know that Mark is a sinful person just like we are. Romans 3.23 says that we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Mark and Mary fall into this category just like we do. We are all on equal ground. It's not elevated above us, and we are not elevated above them. There's one characteristic of Mark. He is a sinner, just like us. I know you're hoping for some inspiration or attribute to say, wow, this Mark is the man. And you will by the end of the day, but you see someone today, or maybe that someone is to the left or to the right, and you see them now, but you have no idea where they came from. I guarantee that I know one thing. We're all sinners. For the Bible tells me so. We didn't sing that in VBS now, did we? Oftentimes we forget that the people we look up to, we see them one way, and then we find out that our hero is fallible. We're rocked. Look, I'm not a golfer. I'm more of a hacker, but I loved to watch Tiger Woods on the golf course. He changed golf forever, and I loved to watch him in any tournament he was in. I didn't think he was a god or my savior, but I thought of him as above me because of his talent. And then in November of 2009, the story broke about the affair he had. I remember where I was. I was sitting in a hotel lobby at a table in Wisconsin playing euchre with my mom, my son Cody, and his cross-country coach Ian. We were there for a few days for the Foot Locker National and Regionals. We'd heard the news and all just stopped. The conversations all pointed to what was going on. Sometimes we tend to do that with people in our lives. We prop people up, or worse, we think lowly of ourselves and we struggle with self-worth issue. Mark is just like you and I. The second characteristic of Mark is found in Acts 13, 13, where it says from Pontos, Paul and his companions sailed to Perga in Pamphylia, where John left them to return to Jerusalem. Mark was a quitter. I know, I know you're saying, you're killing me, Smalls. These are supposed to be uplifting talks to help me get through my tough times. Stop with all the negativity about Mark. Look, we're real here at the point. And if we don't talk about everything going on then and now, then how can we be relevant? Mark quitting caused quite a stir. Paul was ticked as we read in Acts 15, 37 and 38. It says Paul and Barnabas were getting ready to go on their second mission trip and Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them. But Paul did not think it was wise to take him because he had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in the work. Now, we don't know why he quit, but there are a few thoughts as to why. One, maybe Mark was homesick. Ever been homesick? I had a niece that was uh, always wanting to stay with her aunt and uncle, and, and then she would come over because our son was, uh, her cousin was just uh, one year younger than her. So she'd always come over, we'd have dinner, get ready for bed, and then she would just freak out. She would start to cry, she wanted her mom, she wanted to go home, she was homesick. But it doesn't just happen to kids. Because I remember it was in 2011, I was standing in the airport in El Salvador, and I was reflecting on the last week of my first mission trip. But as I thought about it, my mind raced ahead six hours to when I could talk to my wife again. We hadn't spoken for seven days and I missed her. I didn't realize how much until I heard her voice and I was standing in the Houston airport. I must have looked like a mess crying like a little three-year-old. I realized I was homesick. I longed to be home. This may have been Mark as well.
Or maybe Mark resented the change of leadership. Ever hated a change in bosses? Mark was used to having his cousin Barnabas in charge. Barnabas had helped Paul to be accepted by others that feared him. And now Paul was in charge. Or maybe three. Mark became ill. Being sick stinks. I remember my wife and I were in the Bahamas in 2000 with 10 of our closest friends. And we decided to charter a deep sea fishing excursion. Several of our friends were wise and opted out of such excitement. We found out very early on the trip that my wife does not do well on any body of water larger than a bathtub. She became seasick and wanted to desperately go back to dry ground. But the trip had just started. We had another four hours to go. She told me to make this ship turn around now, and I told her it was starting to turn around immediately. I wasn't lying, because our path was a large circle. It was a large circle. And if Mark was in any way, shape, or form half as sick as my wife on that boat, I can understand why Mark maybe left that first mission trip. Or, hey, maybe Mark was unable to withstand the hardships of mission life. Have you ever buckled under the pressure of a situation? Maybe it was pressure in a relationship, a job, a health issue, and you just wanted to ball up and lay in bed or withdraw from everyone. Maybe, just maybe, this was Mark. He was tired of the struggles of mission life, not knowing what each day would bring or what new problem may arise or what each solution will cost. Here at the Point Church, we have several mission teams that we support financially, but more importantly, we support with prayer. And I would ask that you would keep all of our mission teams in your prayers. In El Salvador, Mexico, Africa, India, the Kurds of Iraq. You know, I'm sure that there are times that it can be very daunting. His family is so far away, but we know that God is near. Fifth, maybe that's all the further Mark was going to go. But he just never communicated with Paul or Barnabas. You know, that's a problem with communication. We think it's happening, but it isn't. We tend to do that in a relationship. We assume that the other person knows what we're doing. And they think the same thing. Mark is like, hey, I'm good. And now it's time for me to go home. And Paul's like, hey, tomorrow we're all going to head to the next locale. Sounds like Mark and Paul were in the same book, but on different pages. No matter the reason, I think we can all relate to some of it, if not all of it. The possible scenario is why Mark quit his first mission trip. Nonetheless, Mark was a quitter. And there are points in our life we've quit and maybe times in our future that we may quit. One, Mark's a sinner. And two, Mark is a quitter. What an encouraging sermon, right? All right. Well, hold on. It gets better. Mistakes are effective teachers, and their consequences have a way of making lessons painfully clear. Those who learn from their mistakes are wise. Mark, like many of us, good learners because of our failures, have chosen to learn from them with a little time and encouragement. Life is full of valleys and mountaintops, and without either, you have neither. Mark, and hopefully you and I, understand that today, now, let's get out of this valley of sins and quits, and let's make our way to the mountaintop. Mark's third characteristic is that he was a great assistant or helper. He was an assistant to three of the greatest early missionaries, Paul, Barnabas' cousin, and Peter. In fact, in Acts 12, 25, it says, And Barnabas and Saul returned from a Jerusalem trip where they completed their services, bringing with them John, whose other name was Mark. Being a helper with a servant's heart is vital to the advancement of the kingdom and to God's glory, especially if that's your gift that God's given you. I would encourage you to be like Mark. Serve and do it with all your heart. Look, we have plenty of spots here at the Point Church. You can get connected. You can greet in person or online. You can seat people. You can be in the kids' ministry, coffee ministry, office work. Pick a spot. Don't let the valleys of your life keep you from the mountaintop experience. Let's look at the fourth and final characteristic of Mark. He was persistent. He did not, did not let the mistakes of his youthfulness stop him. He had personal maturity, and that came from time. Mistakes of life and lessons learned. The proof is in the pudding. Let's look back at what Paul said about Mark in Acts. You remember the first mission journey? Acts 13, 13 says from Paphos, Paul and his companions sailed to Perga in Pamphylia, where John left them to return to Jerusalem. And then Paul and Barnabas were getting ready for their second trip in Acts 15. It said uh, Barnabas wanted to take John, also called Mark, with them. But Paul did not think it was wise because he had deserted them. Well, now let's see what he says. Mark, just like you and I, are sometimes remembered by who we were and not who we are. We allow our mistakes to define us when it's Christ who defines us and where we find our identity. What does Paul say about Mark now? Later in life, after the growth in his life, 2 Timothy 4.11 says, only, and this is Paul, he's writing for prison. He says, only Luke is with me. Get Mark, bring him with you because he is helpful to my ministry. This is huge. Like I said, Paul's in prison. He's passing the torch of leadership to Timothy. And Paul says, get Mark because he's helpful in my ministry. This is the same Mark that Paul said was a quitter. He didn't want to do anything with him. He declined to take Mark on a second missionary trip, but now, wow, this Mark is the man. At the end of that three-hour pink Jeep tour, the last 30 minutes, we did some off-roading. This is an experience I had never done. We went up hills, we went down hills. We were twisting in the Jeep all different ways. We were holding on and laughing. We had a great time on an off-road experience. When you experience the excitement of a vacation or a big event, you naturally want to tell somebody. 
Telling the story brings the original thrill of excitement as you relive the experience. You can sense his excitement. Mark 1.1, the beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. This is the only time in the book of Mark that Mark gives you his opinion. After that, he lets Jesus take over and he, he lets Jesus show you the way through his miracles, through his parables, through what he does with everybody he encounters every single day. Mark is so excited. He wants to get into this book. and He wants you to know that this is the beginning of the good news. And that may be you today. That may be you looking for something, searching for something. I have a sister-in-law that she's self-proclaimed agnostic. She's like, I don't, you know, I don't want to, I don't believe there is, or I don't believe there isn't. And we always have great conversations. And she asks me questions. I answer them. If I can't answer them, I look them up and we talk, we talk, we discuss. And she was just at the house the other day and we had a family fun day and uh, everybody had left and she spent the night because she's off the next day. And so her and her dogs and me and my wife, we all just sat there watching movies and she started asking questions. I said, this is great. I love these questions because it's her beginning of the good news. She goes, I, I don't know if I believe or not. And I said, continue to ask questions. I gave her a book, The Problem with God. And she said, I will definitely read this. But it's the beginning of the good news. See, the, the word doesn't return void. You use it and, and it doesn't return void. And she was singing uh, the other day as we were both uh, at a funeral. I was officiating a funeral and her and my father-in-law were singing some of the songs at the funeral. And I thought in my head as she was singing hallelujah, hallelujah, I was like, oh, this is so amazing because she has no idea that those words will not return void. And she brings up these questions and she wants to read and she wants to know. But that's the beginning of the good news. And that's what Mark is saying to you today. If you don't have that good news, if you don't have Jesus as your Messiah, the Son of God, today is the beginning of your good news. This series, the story of Jesus, stick with us all summer. Stick with us all summer. Go through the streets and the alleys and the homes and walk with Jesus and his disciples. Come back every week. This is the overview, the 6,000 foot view. This isn't down in, the, down in the, the mix like Jesus and the disciples want. So come back. Let this be the beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God. Welcome to the story of Jesus. Let's pray. Father God, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for inspiring Mark to, to write this. After he quit his first mission trip and then he was not even thought of, he was thought of by Barnabas to go on the second and Paul said, no, he's not coming with us. He was an assistant with Peter and Paul and Barnabas. And then as he gets older and wiser and uses his mistakes like we do, Father, that we learn from those, we give them all to you and say, teach me something, teach me. And Mark did, he, he, he learned, he learned what to do. And at the end of Paul's life, he says, get, he tells Timothy, get Mark, he is vital to the growth. He's vital to me. He's vital to the growth. And Father, that was the beginning of Mark way back when, when he was young, he quit. We don't know why, but you do. It was you, as you took something that was just something, a quit, something that he had just done, and you said, I can make something great out of this. And Father, that's our lives today. There are times I quit. I quit on you daily, but yet I come back to you and I say, Father, why? And you show me. You help me. You lift me up. Father, I know that somebody needs to be lifted up. Something, something's going on in their life. Somebody's looking for you and searching for you, Father. And I pray that they would, they would come to know you, that their beginning would start today. The beginning of the good news would start today, that they would give their life over to you and say, I'm yours, to Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. And Father, as we go through this series all summer, may you just speak volumes. You May your kingdom just expand, just explode throughout the world, locally and abroad, everywhere, Father. I pray that people would come to know you as we get through this book of Mark that you inspired. Jesus, we thank you for being obedient to the cross, for creating a way for us to get to the Father. We love you, but you love us more. It's in Jesus' mighty, powerful, and effective name that we pray. Amen. Hey there! Thank you so much for watching and checking us out. Hey, I want you to know we go live every Sunday, 9, 10, 15, and 11, 30. So I would love for you to like and subscribe to make sure that we can stay connected together all the time. I'll see you next time. Bye!